Hey golfers and welcome back to another edition of the Second Swing Thoughts podcast and uh, today it's all about the Open Championship wrapping it up. Um, not as thrilling of a tournament this year uh, but we certainly have a lot of things to talk about here um, and we of course we have Pierce Lanou back with us. Uh, already wrote up the Sunday Swing which is on secondswing.com now go read it. Um, the recap of the entire event um, and you know I might as well just dive right into it. Pierce um, a name that I think we may have skipped over, and I think basically everybody else in golf skipped over, is mm-hmm. who dominated this tournament. That's Brian Harmon. Uh, and I, I, I mean, you look back at his sort of his history, he has a solid history on, in Lynx golf. He had been playing well leading up to it. So perhaps an afterthought who shouldn't have been an afterthought, but um, either way, I mean, he played almost flawless golf for 72 holes. Yeah, uh, Brian Harmon. Winning the Open by six shots was yeah. not on my right. ba- my bingo card this week, um, but that's I mean that's kind of why we love these tournaments mm-hmm. and that's that's what we talked about last week too. Like the, the Open Championship is really a tournament where there isn't a style of play that kind of you know matches up perfectly. Like oh this guy should win because he does this really well. It's it's more just kind of whoever can can get around the get around the course and. Get the ball in the hole and whatever it takes to, to get it done, I guess, is is how you win these things. And, um, yeah, Harmon's kind of one of those guys, like Wyndham Clark at the U.S. Open. Nobody really mm-hmm. gave him a chance. And he proved me wrong, and, and he, he proved the rest of the field wrong as well. So pretty, right. pretty impressive. And I think, uh, you know, he talked about it afterward to the media, but and you could hear it even on the broadcast as well, like the – you know, not that the fans across the pond are hostile, right? But there were certainly some elements of um, kind of maybe hoping for some of these hometown guys, mm-hmm. Fleetwood, McElroy, to make that charge. And yeah. you could hear, you know, there was reportedly some booze even when he yeah. hit the first tee shot or was introduced on the first tee. Um, I didn't quite hear that, but I also had my volume relatively low on the mm-hmm. TV, so it could have happened. Yeah. But regardless, if there is a if there's an environment where it might be hostile, if you will, for Harmon to, you know, sleep on and hold a lead in a major championship, it would be across the pond. And, you know, there was a couple instances on both Saturday and Sunday where it looked like that lead might shrink, but he responded right away and took care of business. Yeah. Yeah. And to touch on the the heckling. Yeah. um, I think Fleetwood in one of his, it was either Saturday or Sunday in his post-round interview was like, yeah, like, I heard some things out there that like I won't even repeat. Like he, <laughs> he was, Harmon was getting he was getting the business for sure. I mean, obviously the fans were were hoping for for Fleetwood I think to oh yeah to come through. I mean he grew up but they said like a half hour mm-hmm. up the road. Um, but yeah, I mean just kind of Harmon's kind of one of those guys that just like I, he he seems like he embraces the, yeah. the underdog role and he he likes that and. Um, former Georgia Bulldog. They kept calling him a Bulldog all week, and that's I think that's a perfect perfect description right. of Brian Harmon. Well, and his stature, too, it mm-hmm. sort of lends itself to Five, seven. having this underdog sort of mantra about mm-hmm. him. And, you know, I think a lot of people have talked about his career now in the last 24 hours where he, um, you know, he, he's only won twice on the PGA mm-hmm. Tour, uh, but he's been so consistent placing well, finishing well, playing good enough golf to make, I think, $30 million in earnings. On the yeah, just tour. shy of $32 million now. Yeah, it's and pretty... so to, you know, not have that necessarily translate to the, or correlate to the right amount of wins, um, you kind of figured something was going to happen soon, the way mm-hmm. he was playing, the way he has played throughout both this year and in past few seasons um, without having won since 2017. Yeah. Something was about to happen there. Something was going to give. Right. And it kind of all came together this week, um, you know, I think you mentioned the the ball striking and the strategy that he was using where he wasn't, which again, we, he's not, doesn't have the ability to overpower the golf course, but you think a lot of the guys out there were trying to overpower this course right away and realized it wasn't going to be as easy as it sounds. And so his style of play of hitting fairways, hitting greens, um, clearly worked out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and putting the absolute lights out. I mean, it was like, I think it was Friday when he went on and shot 65, it was like, he, he didn't miss a putt. Yeah. It was like every other 20-footer he had was middle of the hole. He, on the week, was, did you see the stat, 58 of 59 from inside 10 feet? That's 
preposterous. That is ridiculous. Like the amount of those I miss every round, like I'm like three for 10 on those in my, my typical Sunday morning round. <laughs> 58 of 59 is, yeah, that's absolutely wild. Someone broke it down further, and they were, um, well, first of all, Harmon was 100% from five feet and in, mm -hmm. which is in itself a pretty solid feat, right? Yeah. Because um, especially when you're, you know, on these big greens at these Lynx courses where you probably have 50, 60, 70 footers quite often as you're trying to two-putt these and make par, you probably then find yourself having a lot of those four to five footers to two putt and he yeah. buried them all. And then he was 13 for 14 from five to 10 feet, yeah. which is insane. Those like are, those that, are knee knockers. That is, I mean, you're at the average amateur golfer from five to 10 feet is well under 50%. Oh yeah. Um, probably closer to 25% than, than 50%. Mm -hmm. And 13 out of 14 is insane, yep. especially in, those circumstances at the open championship, you yep. have bad weather, you have the best players in the world chasing you and he's knocking down everything. Mm -hmm. um, that is, I mean, one of the best punting performances I can ever even think of. Yeah. Stone, stone cold on the greens kind of reminded me of Cam Smith last year. Yeah. I mean, the, you think the last two open champions now were just the best putters in the field that week. And, um, I had a few, kind of questions i wanted to ask you yeah. about brian Harmon, and we'll see if see if you know these but um w before we get too deep into it well what, what do you think if i were to just ask you top of your head is brian Harmon's world rank so i do know it you know it i okay. do know it um i know well i should say i knew i don't know if it's updated since but i know what it was before the week right uh, I believe it's 26. Yeah, he was 26. And how about how under the radar is that, by the way? That's unreal. I, yeah. I would have never believed that if you told me that. But I yeah. checked this morning. He's now 10th. So he's 10th now. 10th in the world. Brian Harmon, yeah. Uh, and then... Brian, yeah, and he, well, he's going... I think he's now in the... For sure going to be a Ryder Cup. Yeah, player. that was my next question. Yeah. Is what you... His standings in the Ryder Cup list, the points list yeah. for the U.S. team, he's third. <laughs> so it's yeah. like Scotty Scheffler, and then it's Wyndham Clark and Brian Harmon. Which... Two months ago, if you had yeah. mentioned those two guys, you probably would have been laughed at. Right. But then you look at both of those guys, their results, not just in these events, but their body of work throughout this season and last season, mm -hmm. especially this season for both of those guys. And you can see why they would be, you know, strong considerations for the team, even if they hadn't won these events. If they had yeah. placed top five, say, in both of these majors, um, they'd be strong considerations because they're so solid yeah and now you get Harmon who and I think part of it too is just he doesn't have the big personality or doesn't blow you away with distance like some of these guys or um you know I mean he's like we mentioned he's five foot seven 160 pounds or whatever he is mm -hmm. but he just finds the fairway he hits good approach shots that give himself birdie chances and now on those hot putting days he'll go low and, yeah and that can be really useful at a Ryder Cup too yeah. if you get paired with the right player and I actually I think he's like for this coming Ryder Cup, especially on, on European soil, mm -hmm. I think he's going to be a great, great fit for the team. Obviously, we saw it this week. He isn't really phased by right. the heckling and, and the noise and all that. So, I mean, going into a Ryder Cup, it's definitely going to be probably even more hostile um, on foreign soil over there. So I think, yeah, I think Harmon's the, the type of guy you want to have on your team for sure. Right. And I, I also appreciate the golfers like him who – don't show a lot of emotion on the mm -hmm. course when clearly the the stage the situation might call for it for a lot of people yeah um you'll see frustration expressed or even if something is you know maybe you make a long birdie putt and you kind of celebrate you know and in that scenario when you have everybody not everybody but a lot of the gallery rooting against you to kind of stay present stay calm still understand that you have shots to execute the rest of the way um, I appreciate that in a golfer, and especially if in his, with his career not having a ton of wins for how much golf he's played on tour, how many seasons he's been a card holder, to still have that um, that mindset, I think is, again, it bodes really well for Ryder Cup, and also bodes well for future competition for him. With, yeah. You know, now the FedEx Cup season, you know, upon us here soon, and moving forward into majors season next year. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And I think. Like Harmon has played the majors fairly well mm -hmm. 
as of late, like the last two or three years, I feel like his name is just like always popping up on these leaderboards. And I wonder if that's just sort of a, a product of like, we talked about like that. Like his mentality is so much, I feel like different than a lot of like the big stars out there. Like he, he comes into the field, like knowing he can win these events and he just hasn't done it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this week he, he showed everyone like he's, he's a force to be reckoned with. I mean, he's 36 years old, doesn't hit it very far, but man, he's so accurate. Right. The putter is just, I mean, anytime you can putt like that, like you're going to be able to contend. And, you know, as long as you don't make any, any big mistakes, which he really didn't all week. Like, I, I don't think he made worse than a bogey. He only made a handful of bogeys the whole tournament. Right. Two of them were in the Saturday round and two I of them were in the Sunday round. I believe four of his six birdies, he, or four of his six bogeys, excuse me, he followed up right away right. with a yeah. birdie. So. Saturday, I think he bogeyed two of the first four and then made two birdies, like, immediately. Mm-hmm. And then he did the same thing on Sunday. And those are really, like, the only two moments where he, you thought it might kind of get interesting was after yeah. those two bogeys on Saturday. You're like, okay, he's got you know only like a three or four shot lead, but yeah, just immediate bounce back. Yeah, I mean that's the the mentality that, and I think he's gotten used to it as well. Being the undersized, you know, not uh, not the I guess cult like fandom that some of these guys have sort of created for themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, the Ricky Fowlers, um, the Justin Thomases. You know, these guys that have become popular and. Um, Harmon's been performing like those guys would play in sort of their their primes almost. Where, yeah. You know, he's been routinely in the top 25, top 10, you know, he, and even in majors too. And But he just hasn't had the fanfare for it. Right. And um, so he, he knows going in, like, yeah, not many people are thinking about me, but I'm just going to go play my game. And mm-hmm. it really worked at Royal Liverpool, obviously. So, yeah. Um, but we have to talk about the putting a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And specifically, I want to talk about the putter itself. So, because on this show, we've talked a lot about putters. We yeah. obviously the uh, the Versa Jailbird got a lot of attention as Wyndham Clark, Ricky Fowler, Keegan Bradley were winning with that. Um, this one's a little bit different. You know, the oversized tailor-made Spider. He's been using it for a long time, um, and you lo- you watch it on TV, and it's just <laughs> enormous. It's like, like a spaceship. It's it's enormous <laughs> compared to even other mallets that you see yeah. other players using. Yeah. Is there's a certain extra? It's like it's zoomed in a little bit more. Um, <laughs> what what is your like? I mean, what are your thoughts on I mean, that putter? My thoughts on putting is you know whatever gets the ball in the hole. Yeah. But like, why does it have to be that big? It is. I it's just, huge. Like I can't stand looking at that thing. But um, you know, I if I could putt like Brian Harmon, I I would use anything. So yeah. So my take on this is, again, I I believe in the, you know that sense of confidence a player needs to have in their putter. And if that happens to be, you know, best with a blade or, you know, the answer type, Newport type, which is the most popular shape of putter, I think, out there, if that's what you like to look at, then go use it, right? Yeah. Um, but I think if if aesthetics aren't your, you know, aren't a big deal to you as a putter, and I really think you need to find the highest MOI mallet that you can use because it's going to give you the most benefit performance-wise. Right. Um, there's just, I mean, the technology in it, there's, you know, less, you know, twisting going on if you miss the center of the face. Um, and then obviously there's both firm and soft feeling mallets out there for you to use. So the feel aspect, you can certainly dial in with whatever model it might be. I use a Ping Harwood, which is actually a similar mm-hmm. size to Harmon's. Yeah, those are big. Uh, they're large. Yeah. It's a lot to look at. Uh, but there's so much advantage to those, and I will always preach for that for an amateur golfer if they're not, you know, aesthetically oriented, which I know a lot of people are. So I'm not yeah. trying to talk down to those people because I know right. it's a big deal to a lot of players. Um, but the technology behind these putters, the forgiveness in them, and as someone like me who I do miss hit a lot of putts, like it happens. Uh, you have to be so precise on putting to hit the center of the face, but to have that correction there. Um, helps a ton for me, so mm-hmm. um, I will always vouch for the mallets, and I'm always, I'm going to defend Brian Harmon for his putter choice being as large and perhaps ugly as it might be to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. The thing gets gets the ball in the hole. Yeah, yep, yeah. and it's uh, he's an open champion, so you can't knock it too much. <laughs> I mean, I I play a mallet as well. It's not quite that big, 
Um, but yeah, I got the, the face balance, mm-hmm. uh, mallet styled putter. And I mean, I need all the help I can get. So maybe I should transition into the, the well, oversized spider. Well, here's the, the deal. If, if, if it's visually, if it's too much, that's, you know, yeah, that's, that's understandable. But like we talk about mallets, like the Versa Jailbird, you know, that thing was on a heater for a while there. Yeah. I mean, if you, and if you look around the tour landscape at guys who have struggled with putting, a lot of them have switched to something mm-hmm. that is a larger putter head with more weight behind it to stabilize it. Um, and a lot of them have turned things around doing that. So um, I think if you look around at, at, at tour, you find guys that are towards the top of the putter list. It's either you know guys that have been successful for a long time using a specific putter that they love to look at. Um, Tiger Woods might be an example of mm-hmm. that, right? Or you find guys that have manipulated with their putter setup a little bit that have found something, and a lot of times it is a mallet that provides the most performance for them. Yep. And so um, it's a fickle thing, and we need to talk about putting because that's really how Harmon kind of separated himself from the field this week is just making everything he looked at except mm-hmm. for one putt inside 10 feet. Yeah, yeah, it was starting to annoy me, honestly. Like, <laughs> It's like, am I going to have to watch Brian Harmon make every putt for – the whole weekend and that's that's exactly what happened so yeah because i mean i think you and i both were sort of rooting for this like entertaining mm-hmm. like pressure filled finish yeah for these guys and we didn't get that because yeah. of how good Harmon's putting was right but um i still you know i always i appreciate the performance he put on though yeah um absolutely you know, the guy that the sort of journeyman pga tour guy which you know he's doing really well for himself to be on the pga tour as long as he has but to have only won twice, again, overlooked completely for a while there, and then to come through like this dominant fashion, never really a doubt, at least for the last 12 holes on Sunday, there was never really any doubt he was going to win. Yeah. Um, I think it's really cool to, to see that. And given this whole season that we had with majors, I mean, we had some really, really fun tournaments. Um, if you want to call this one a quote-unquote dud, as I think Golf Digest did, um, fine by us, but that was a really good performance. And, you know, his, I think he was due for something like that. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely can't, can't take it away from him. And, you know, he obviously, he obviously deserved it. He played the best golf, but if you just hypothetically remove him from the picture oh, yeah, at this tournament, been a crazy finish. Like that's what, that's the leaderboard everyone wanted to see. So you had John Rahm, Jason Day, uh, Tom Kim, mm-hmm. Sepp Straka, all in that tie for second. And then close behind, you had guys like Hovland, Fleetwood, McElroy. McElroy. Um, just really all the all mm-hmm. the big names that you expected to play well were all kind of right. congested. It was almost that, like a who's who of the European Ryder Cup team yeah. after Harmon. Right. You know, Ron McElroy, Fleetwood, Hovland, yep. Sepp Straka. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, that was, you know, if you're a, European Ryder Cup fan, you're probably looking fondly at the results of this tournament. Yeah. Being that it seems like your guys are sort of trending in the mm-hmm. right direction here. Um, but, I mean, Brian Harmon, what a performance. Not something that we envisioned happening, mm-hmm. but you got to give it to him. And uh, we should also mention, as a, uh, you know, he's got a full bag of Titleist with the exception to that putter. Yeah. Um, actually, old school, in a way, old school to TSI2 yep. driver and Ferry Wood. Um, Similar to the last major yeah. winner. Wyndham Clark, he plays the the TSI, TSI three, three, yeah. So and Harmon's got the the TSI two in there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's uh, something to note. Maybe the uh, you know now that you can get those uh, a great value at second swing with the TSRs oh, yeah. out now. If you're looking for some new medals, last two major champions have been playing the TSI series for yeah. titles. So um, all right, we got to mention some other names here. Uh, we finally did not have a top 12 finish uh, by Scotty yeah. Scheffler. He tried on Sunday. Uh, he, tried. he almost brought it all the way back up I think there. he finished I think he in the top 25. Two or three shots yeah. shy of, of climbing back into that mm-hmm. top 12. But um, it was just a, a, a tough stretch of golf on Friday and Saturday yeah. that did him in. I really thought he was going to miss the cut. I mean, the yeah, up and down yeah. he made on Friday just to get in was remarkable <laughs> from that hot bunker. M- miraculous in a way. Yeah. Like that bounce. Yeah. Yeah. I... I mean, I didn't see it coming that he would be sweating the cut line on Friday, but that's kind of what what the Open can do to you. Even the best players in the world sometimes, if you just if you don't have it, it's hard to it's hard to figure it out out there for sure. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, down week for Scotty, not a top twelve, but still shot sixty seven on Sunday. Right. And posted a 
top 25. So yeah, his worst finish in worst half finish a year in, in like 20 events is yeah. 25th at the or 23rd at the Open Championship. Yeah, you know that's not too bad of a stretch of golf there for Scotty. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, the other one we got to talk about Rory and how you know once again. I mean, I shouldn't say once again because this one really it would have been it would have required a remarkable round of golf. Yeah. I mean, to go up to reach. I mean, he would have had to put up a, a historical performance to catch Harmon right. in this round. But, um, you know, he w- did make some noise there for a little bit on yeah. Sunday. Yeah, he came out swinging. I think he birdied three, four, and five mm-hmm. to start his round and kind of, you know, and, and it was raining, like, really hard. <laughs> like, yeah. Sunday all day was just, like, a heavy downpour, so... What yeah, I saw it, there was so the difference in, in how these holes played was massive because yes. they talked about on the first hole, Rory, the previous day on Saturday, had hit his driver 320 yards and had about 130 in, mm-hmm. right? And then on Sunday, he had his drive about 250, 260 and had over 200 yards. Yeah, I think he was like hitting four shot. iron into the green or something. And that just kind of showed you how the cold and rain sort of that had developed and then there was some wind that those guys were facing as well on Sunday that it died down throughout the day but early on it was windy um that that can change everything out there and that's kind of the beauty of Lynx Lynx golf is that the course is the course sure but the way it's played changes so drastically Mm -hmm. on the weather and if you can't adapt to it then you're going to be falling behind yeah yeah and uh, like I'm so used to seeing opens where it's like not as wet like when yeah. it's dry you know players are relying on like that was the tiger Woods 40 50 wind. yards of roll mm-hmm. landing iron shots right. like 30 40 yards short of the green and just letting them kind of bounce up but yeah with that rain it's it was just kind of playing like your your typical typical right. course the ball hits the ground and it's not going anywhere which mm-hmm. for an open is weird yeah and those and that, guys were used to it playing a little more like that the yeah. first three days yeah where they could bounce the balls up there or they could you know rely on a little bit more roll on the greens mm-hmm. or with their tee shots but it just everything changed with that added rain and it's uh, it makes me wonder how much different or maybe higher the scoring would have been at st andrews last year because everybody went so low last year mm-hmm. and there was record scores but i mean you, you get some rain to you know i think everybody was wanting some wind to pick up last yeah. year and make it tougher but in reality the wind probably made those downwind holes super easy for them mm-hmm. Whereas you get some rain to kind of soak up the golf course a little bit, it probably could have made it a little tougher that way. Yeah. But regardless, that's the beauty of it. I mean, last year the Open was one of the easiest tracks, um, or at least score uh, scoring based, right? It was very yeah. easy for the players. But then you could turn turn the corner to this year, and it takes an unbelievable putting performance to get double digits under par. Yeah, it was definitely playing harder than. Brian Harmon made it look like yeah. he was the only player in the field to reach 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13 under par. <laughs> yeah. The next closest was, I think, Straka got to 8 under yeah. for like two holes and then uh, dropped back with a bogey kind of at the end there. But, yeah, it's – I thought the course was was pretty cool. I don't know what you thought of, like, the internal OB. There was a lot of controversy yeah. about that. Like, I think on hole – was it three especially? Like, it came in basically, like, five yards off the fairway. And like yeah, I saw a lot of that's, people. Uh, I, I personally don't love it, but I yeah. get it because there's, you know, I, we see all this talk about modernizing the game and trying to adapt it to the sort of modern distance that there is. And that's one way to sort of make the course play as it was supposed to, right? And right. we talked about in the previous podcast episode about this is the Open Championship. This is how golf was, quote unquote, meant to be played by the creators of the game you know and to allow for that that internal out out of bounds sort of prevents players from trying to take on that Mm -hmm. carry or take on cutting the corner a little bit and sort of um changing the for the play of that hole but in a way it also gives a a benefit to the guys like brian Harmon, who would never go for that in the corner or wouldn't take on that out of bounds instead are going to play that little cut out there 260 yards and take their medicine, mm-hmm. and now every player in the in the field is, both, is forced to do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we saw it too. Another notable one was on the 18th hole, all along the right yep. side, was that OB, and we saw. I think Ricky Fowler was the first one on on Thursday to really be punished by that. Yep. I think he hit two of them. Tyrrell Hatton was Hatton, succumbed yep. to it on 
twice on the same yeah, hole. Yeah, yeah. I think somebody made like a ten. Yeah. On Thursday or Friday, just yeah. I mean, you miss it. You miss the fairway by a yard or two, and yeah. you're you're out of bounds, out of luck. I, mean, I get it, certainly for those players. Mm-hmm. Um, I would probably strongly disagree with it for like a local muni trying right. to, you know, separate a hole from another hole that's next to it. Um, but it certainly added an interesting element, and it would have been really fun had the tournament been close down the stretch to see these guys step up to that tee box with that out of bounds lurking so closely to the fairway mm-hmm. and try to hit a pressure tee shot. Yeah. A lot of guys were just bailing left and then oh, yeah. they'd, they'd end up in the thick wet stuff on the left. And then the, the second shot there. would squirt out to the right and, <laughs> and you're still going in the, right in the penalty area anyway. So yeah, that be, I mean, you, was, that was a beast. The hospitality hole. area left of 18 was heavily populated. By yeah. Golf shots. Yeah. Off the, the tee there's going to be some bruise. Players are just aiming down the left rough because they don't want to flirt with that out yeah. of bounds. And so if you were, if you were over on that side as a spectator, you you were in da- in the danger zone. Yeah, yeah, there was balls flying in there all day yesterday for sure. I know, I know a bunch of guys just, yeah, they just launched it into the stands yeah. and took. They had the little drop zone there, like eighty yards from the green, and well, and especially with the the fact that it was playing as a three shot hole, I don't think anybody got there in two on at least on Sunday. No, on Sunday, I don't think so. Um, there was no reason then for those guys to even flirt with that out of bounds because no. either way they're going to have to hit a third really full swing into the green. Mm-hmm. So just kind of, it's like I said, it's crazy how different the course plays because they add some rain and became, you add some moisture to the conditions and suddenly everything plays several, several yards longer yeah. than it did the previous three days. Um, but to Harmon's credit, it didn't really matter to him. He just nope. kept sinking, put, sinking putts, hitting fairways, hitting greens. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it takes to win. Uh, to win an open is so you got to hit fairways. You can't be hitting out of the out of the fescue. And there was, I think there was one hole on on Sunday where he hit it into one of those. What do they call it? Gorse gorse yeah. bushes. And you know, I really thought that point in the tournament was like, okay, like this is like the one chance where like this could really shake things up. But he was able to just take his unplayable and draw. I think he just made bogey. Yeah. It's like which. I, you look at, you look around at other scorecards of guys that were even near the top. I mean, you you would you would see a big a double bogey, a double box on the scorecard yeah. from basically everybody yep. at some point throughout the tournament. Mm-hmm. But Harmon avoided those, and then he obviously made the birdie putts that he needed to, and made a lot more of those than anybody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The putter again was just kind of the key for him this week, and I thought it was funny too after he after he won. He carried the putter all the way up the, mm-hmm. the stairs, across the entire walkway, into the scores center. I think, I think Azinger made a comment. He's like, he's probably gonna sleep with that thing tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 58, 59 inside 10 feet. I'm, yeah. I, if I were able to do that in any stretch of golf, I might do the same yeah, thing. Yeah, put That's, that thing in a in a trophy case for sure. Yeah. That is, um, a truly like I I'm, I still can't wrap my mind around how preposterous it is yeah. to make 58 out of 59 putts. Mm-hmm inside 10 feet obviously that includes like the one foot tap in right. and stuff but 13 of 14 from 5 to 10 feet is truly astonishing like mm-hmm. i i'm it's fascinating that someone could even do that considering you know um traditionally the open greens are not as smooth or fast as you know the greens over here in the states it's right. typically a little bit more unpredictable with speed with the moisture and the weather being different, and so to, yep. to be as dialed as he was is, I mean, he's a he's a deserving champion for sure. Yeah, they I think on Saturday at some point during the broadcast they showed that that stat on the screen of like he was like a hundred percent at that point on yeah. putts inside uh, ten feet, and I'm like, oh boy, like they're gonna jinx him. Not he's gonna start missing everything, and um, that obviously didn't happen. But mm-hmm. uh, the other kind of interesting thing on on Brian Harmon is the waggles. Oh my you gosh. See the waggle, yeah, we have to the talk waggle about the waggles, counters. Yeah. I think one of them yesterday was like 13. Yeah. And I, I, uh, I feel like there's been some instances before, cause I don't think it's for him. Like, all right, I could get my 13 waggles in before I hit, you no. know, I think it's more of a getting himself comfortable yeah, until he, he feels, until he feels ready to hit the shot. Yeah. He's going to, he's going to just do look, I'm, it's not the most pleasing thing to watch on TV, certainly, mm-hmm. but Hey, if you are, you know, 
not slow and keeping up with the pace of play and able to get these waggles in, by all means, do what you have to do to hit the golf shot. Yeah. Um, you just, I think at some point, as he becomes more popular, maybe he gets more TV time here. Maybe. Maybe the TV, uh, you know, the TV crews will pan to him when he's after, <laughs> you know, eight or nine waggles and we don't have to watch all yeah, of them. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, and it's kind of reminiscent of, like, Kevin Na back in the day. Yeah. I remember, like, I think it was the players and... Remember I that. can't remember the, the year, years. maybe 2012 or 2013, something like that. And yeah, yeah, he was just waggling for like a minute, and, and he'd he, like he'd like yell at himself. And Harmon hasn't gotten to that point, no. so I think he's doing all right. But right, right. It's In some case, there are some other players that I'm always fascinated with how long they can stand over the golf ball yeah. before pulling the trigger. Um, but hey, I mean, clearly it works for the guy. And I didn't. It doesn't seem like he's particularly slow as, yeah. a, as a whole. He just Obviously, he has these, this this waggle sort of um, tendency he has to kind of go through before pulling the trigger. But everybody's got a little something. Remember Jason Duffner? I yep. Mean, he's still grinding it out there on tour, but yep. that was that's the most famous waggle I think for I sure. ever remember. So yeah. it's not like a totally uncommon thing. No, it's not. There's definitely, I mean, everyone's got their thing. Like, I think, a, like, you call it like a trigger, essentially. Yeah. Like, every golfer has their, yeah. their trigger. Matthew Wolf, famous one, too. Yeah. Yeah, I think mine's kind of just like a little forward shaft lean, and then yeah. and then I'm good to go. But um, yeah, I mean whatever whatever you got to do to get comfortable over the ball, I guess yeah. is as long as you're not slowing down pace. Right. It's, it yeah, that's it all is. I think myself and any golfer would ask is just don't slow me or slow down the general pace of play, and you can do whatever you want. So, right. Um, yeah. Regardless, though, a fascinating tournament. I'll wrap up here with sort of one question for you that we can kind of go over and. It's just in regards to all four men's majors this year, and that is, of the four, which performance do you think was the best of the four winning performances? Mm. So you had John Rahm at yeah. Augusta winning by, I believe, four shots, three or four shots. Um, you then had Brooks Kepka kind of redeeming himself from Augusta, finishing runner-up and sort of losing that lead. Comes back and wins by a couple shots at the PGA. Wyndham Clark then kind of surviving at the U.S. Open, and then, of course, you have Brian Harmon this past weekend winning yeah. by six. Yeah, well, before this week, I probably would have said Rom, um, you know, picking up his, his second major and kind of doing it in a dominant mm -hmm. fashion um, was super impressive. And then I think this week, I mean, Harmon won by six shots. Yeah. So, like, it's kind of hard to dispute that that was the most dominant performance in any of the majors this year, but... Um, I think I had the most fun probably watching the U.S. Open. Yeah. And a lot of people kind of didn't like that tournament with the course and everything. But right. Um, that leaderboard was 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 good coming oh, down yeah. the stretch, and that's kind of what I'm looking for mm -hmm. when I watch majors. I just want it to be like a a tight tight finish to the end. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we didn't get that at the Open. I I still was was getting up at like 3.30. Oh, yeah. I, I think I got up at 3.30 on Thursday and like 4 on Friday. And, yeah. Um, no, you, was, just, you go to bed an hour or two earlier than you yeah. usually would, and then you get up, and that's kind of how we have to do it over here in the States. Yeah. But, the um, yeah, I'm kind of with you. I, I still will lean to Rom at Augusta just because of how well he hit the ball. Mm -hmm. So that's where he was kind of gaining his strokes right. at Augusta was yeah. tee to green, you know, hitting fairways, hitting greens, hitting really good approach shots. And then grinding through that tough weather stretch on the weekend. That's with right. The delay and stuff that he had yeah. to kind of go through. And that's where sort of Kepka fell off of his game. Um, so I think I'll lean. If you're going to go with Harmon, which is a very fair answer, uh, I'm going to go with Rom with the answer to that question. But again, the, the putting that, I mean, the putting from Harmon is one of the best performances I can remember. Yeah. So yeah, they're was, both deserving in their own right. For sure, yeah. And, and one more thing here. Uh, we got the, the 3M coming up yes. in the cities this week. Yes. Are you going to go out there at all? Unfortunately, I will not because I'll be out of town okay. uh, this week for something else. But um, I it's I saw the forecast. It's yeah. going to be hot. steamy out there. Yeah. Uh, welcoming the PJ Tour's best in sure. some 100-degree heat for yeah. at least Thursday and Friday. But, yep. um, yeah, we, why don't we go through a little mini preview here if you yeah will. who do you like this week so i'm fascinated to see what happens with justin thomas mm -hmm. he uh committed very kind of recently here yeah i last, think realizing that he week. wants either more FedEx cut points maybe it's um some kind of more 
some performances under his belt for the Ryder Cup. He wants to be a captain's pick there, um, what have you. Um, so I, I still I need to see it before I believe in him. Yeah. But one guy that um, just the only thing that's kind of you know prohibiting me from really going all in is Sung J M is the the travel back from overseas. Okay. You know I think believe three of the last four winners of the three M Open have been guys that did not play the week before at okay. the Open because so they've been in hmm. the United States. Yeah. Um, so but Sung J M has had a several good finishes at the 3M Open. Yeah. I believe he was runner-up or tied for runner-up last year. He was close last year, and so, I remember I followed him on the back nine on Sunday last year, and he's so fun to watch. Oh, yeah. Just hits the hits the thing on the screws like yep. every time. So that'd be my early pick right now. Okay. Would be, it would be him. Yeah, I like that. I've got my eye on a couple of guys this week. Uh, actually, three. I'll say three guys. Okay. And two of them are, are youngsters. One of which who just won this week actually, Akshay Batia. Yep. So he won the Barracuda this week. Um, kind Big of week in, for lefties. Yeah. Yep. Right another lefty. Akshay Batia. He's 21 years old. Um, he's kind of popped up a few times this year. I think he finished like fourth in Mexico and mm-hmm. um, a couple other top tens maybe here and there. But you know, breaking through this week, I think, like with a lot of these young guys, like once they get that first win, oh, yeah. like the confidence is just through the roof and. I feel like he is one of those guys that can play a course like TPC Twin Cities. Like, it suits his game pretty well. He's pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. I think uh, he struggles with the putter, though, like a lot of guys. So if he can can putt fairly well, I think he'll have a good chance this week. And then um, the other youngster would be Ludwig Aberg, who has been playing great lately. Um, Speaking of the Ryder Cup, not completely... Out of the question for him to for end sure. up as the captain's pick. There. Yeah, yeah, and there's been a handful of, of first-time winners lately, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm thinking maybe he'll continue that trend. And then uh, the last guy that I like this week is Emiliano Grillo, mm-hmm. who yeah. I think he finished. He was like, he was in the top five. Maybe? I think he was this last or week. I think he was. Like he might have been in that group at six under. Mm-hmm. Um, played well the week before, and he won the the Charles Schwab. I think last yeah. month. So he's definitely playing well. He's he's Argentinian, so maybe you know the heat won't really True. bother him yeah. as much. So those are my those are my three early uh, early players to watch. Yeah, I guess, this it'll be a fun tournament. It's always fun for us here with our yeah. office being based here in Minnesota. I know a large number of the the team here goes out and yep. watches and has has a lot of fun with that. And then I remember the first iteration of it was spectacular, right? In yeah, 2019 when you had the the finish between Matthew Wolf winning with that eagle putt, yeah, Colin Morikawa was, and Bryson were all right there. It was there. remarkable. Uh, I was there on the, the 18th what a, green. What a kickoff for that, for this yeah. event. And it's been pretty darn good ever since. Um, Tony Finau, the defending champion, yep. always one to watch. Um, lots of water out on this course. Yeah. Lots of water. And I know that the redesign Tom Lehman did, uh, I think a few years ago, they've expanded those water hazards. So there's... Placement tee shots for sure are required, yeah. but if you can skirt around this water, you usually have some good birdie chances. Yep, yeah, there's definitely some landmines out there, and I think 18 is probably the most notable yeah. Oh, yeah. hole, the par five finish, where you, know, you hit a good drive and you're going to have a chance to give it a give it a crack in two, but you, know, you miss it at all and you're going to oh, be yeah. you're going to be wet. Well, that's for the sure. thing about that 18th hole is the layup shot isn't even like. There's no, nowhere to really lay it up doesn't, either. It doesn't seem worth it to me to lay up unless you're like 300 yards away. Yeah, I mean it's the layup shot. There's they've the redesign on that hole has made it so that there's like not really one spot to lay up to. Like no. there are on so many par fives that if you're trying to you're deciding not to go for it in two, right. there's usually a spot that you go to to hit that yeah. for that third shot. There really isn't one. It's on, really on narrow hole. up that it's left super side. Super narrow. There's and, bunkers yep. all around, and as that dog leg turns right, it's uh. It is a crazy golf hole. So really, yeah. you kind of have to hit that. You have to toy the, toe the line between being aggressive and going towards the water without putting yourself too far left where you have to, have yep. to lay up. Yeah, I think the tee shot there is definitely the the most pivotal. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you got to hit a good second shot. But if you, if you don't hit a good tee shot, you're going to be forced to kind of try to lay up in that skinny yeah. little landing area. And you might risk a bunker left or yep. water right. And, it has, been, it has produced some fireworks yeah, over the years. For you sure. had Matt Wolf in 2019. You had Cameron Champ in 2021, mm-hmm. who had a shaky tee shot with a two-shot lead and then punched it out and ended up getting up and down from for par from like 100, 
30 yards. Yeah, yeah. So that'll be a, it'll be a fun tournament. For um, sure. And it's an important one for a lot of players trying to get yeah. in that top 125. Two weeks FedEx left Cup. of the regular season. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, so um, it'll be a fun one. But Pierce, thank you for jumping on. We know you'll have the 3M covered with the Sunday swing next week. Um, but uh, golfers, make sure if you haven't yet, you are watching on YouTube, you're subscribed to the YouTube channel. Um, otherwise, you are followed and subscribed um, wherever you get your podcasts. And um, we'll be back next week with another episode of Second Swing Thoughts.